Hi, this is Steve Bartlett. Once again, what an awesome opportunity I have to be with you. I want to thank all of you for tuning in. You know, we're going to go over God's great revelations today. This outline, I have preached literally all over the world, and God has used it to win thousands of people to himself. I believe when we know the message that we put ourselves in a position to really be effective in evangelism. And in our first evangelism training manual, I, I wanted to lay a foundation with these first couple of lessons, but now we get to really how to do evangelism. If you could get a hold of this, you would simply know the message that the world needs to hear. And what we're going to talk about today is God's great revelations, the four greatest truths revealed in the Word of God that, in my mind, stand head and shoulders above all the rest of them. And these become, if you will, a template or an outline for our evangelistic sermons and our evangelistic ministries. Now, let's just think about it for a minute. And hopefully you have a, a copy of your, of your uh, manual, your outline here. I'm on page 19. Again, God's great revelations. What's the first thing God reveals to the human race? And this becomes the very first thing that the human race needs to understand if we're going to be effectively used by God to bring them to him. So what's the first thing that God reveals to the human race? Well, we find it in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What's the first thing that all other revelations are built on? The fact that God is our creator. I could put it like this. Creation is the first great revelation that God gives to mankind. Where we come from why we exist, what we're doing here on this planet, all the great philosophical questions of life are answered in the very first chapter of the Bible. God is the reason we exist. We were created in his image and in his likeness. Between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, we see how God created man. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates just out of absolute thin air. The word is bara in Hebrew. It means to create from nothing. And he creates man in his own image and in his own likeness. And yet in Genesis chapter 2, what do we find? That man's body is formed out of the dust of the ground. It helps us to understand that there is a there is a temporary or physical side of our existence, but then there is also an eternal aspect of our creation. God breathes into this body that he's formed, and man becomes a living being. Could you imagine that? The first thing that people have got to understand, if anybody's going to actually get saved, if anybody's going to get born again, is that God is their creator. Now, I want you to think about it for a few minutes, because this is what got me back in 1982. I was at Texas Tech University. I didn't know a thing about God. I don't even know if I had any hunger in my heart for God. I walk into a lecture where one of these professors is talking about the origin of the universe. And he tells us, now listen to this, this is amazing. This guy with a PhD, I'm a 19-year-old kid, don't know a thing about God at all. And he literally says, in the beginning, there was absolutely nothing. And then over a process of time, and through chance, everything that exists today came into being. I remember asking the professor after class, wait a minute, you mean to tell me in the beginning was absolutely nothing? If I have absolutely nothing in my hand, what do I have a billion or two or three or four or five billion years later? If I have nothing in the beginning, what do I have all these years later? You know what the guy says to me? 
True story, guys. He says, you know what? I have a problem with that theory, too. Now, I want you to think about it. I'm a 19-year-old kid. This is 1979. This is a few years before I actually got born again and get born again to 1982. But that set my whole life in a different direction because it just didn't make any sense at all to me. The more theories that I studied and that I discovered for the origins of the universe taught me one real true lesson, and that is that science has absolutely no answers for where we come from. You know, it's pretty funny, the other day with my son, Joshua has recently gotten really born again and just turned on for God, and it's been fantastic. But I was talking with him about, about the moon. You have all these different theories of where the moon came from, and the scientists are finally beginning to say, we can't even figure out where the moon comes from. And yet these geniuses are trying to tell us where the whole universe comes from. Guys, it doesn't make any sense at all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you know, one of the most outstanding things about God's creation is that creation declares the power and the glory of Almighty God. On your outline here, you'll see on page 20 some of the, some of the great passages of Scripture that deal with what we call natural revelation. Natural revelation means what can you learn about God? What does nature reveal about God by all the things that are created? Listen to this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Can you imagine that? I remember when I was in the oil field, we used to watch the sun come up off of the, off of the ocean. And obviously that's not what was happening. We were rotating, but at that, you know, bear with me here. And we watched the sun come up off the water. What do you think a whole bunch of lost men stuck out in the Gulf of Mexico are talking about at 4.30 in the morning? But when we look at God's creation, Creation itself is speaking to us, and I'm sitting there with my crew, and all we can think about, all we can talk about is where we come from and where we're going. Could you imagine that? When you look at creation, it reveals the awesomeness of God. It reveals his power and his imagination. And let me just say this. I have had many, many, many conversations with people on streets and in the parks and on the beaches where they would start off their conversation and say, listen, man, you're wasting your time. I don't believe there's a God. And literally in 10 minutes of talking to them, they say to me, okay, man, you've got me. I realize that something created this universe. I'll never forget one time in Fort Lauderdale, I was on the beach. We were ministering there at spring break, and I ran into a chemistry professor, and he knows all of the science and, and everything. All I did was ask him to honestly examine what he says he believes. You know, in five minutes, I hadn't been born again for two years, in five minutes by getting him to look at the awesomeness of creation. This man says to me, okay, you got me. I do realize somehow, some way, something created this universe. That's why we have the natural law that we have. That's why we have the splendor and the beauty. And I mean, you can see intelligent design on everything there is in this world. You know, I have here a wristwatch. Let me ask you, how many of you believe this watch created itself? Now, wait a minute. I'm telling you, after four billion years, leather appeared. And, and somewhere along the way, this, this watch dial created itself, and somehow a battery got put into it. I mean, for me to try to convince you that a wristwatch created itself is, listen, we would call it ridiculous. 
But you look at this universe, infinitely more intricate, with living systems and life and living creatures, and you're going to tell me that somehow all of it was an accident and it just sort of sprang up out of nothing? You know what you and I need to do? We need to help people examine what they have never really examined before, which is their core beliefs. Do you really believe everything in this universe just came out of nothing? That time and chance created everything? See, I'm telling you, use creation. One time I was diving down in Grand Cayman, and we were there with a dive master, and, and he was trying to sort of be funny, but we came up off of the reef. You know the first thing out of his mouth? God must have been on acid. God must have been really stoned when he painted all those fish. Now, wait a minute for just a second. Do you realize creation worked on that man? He looks at the beauty of God's creation. And what's the only thing? This guy isn't a Christian at all. What's the only thing that comes to his mind? God had to be on something to have such an imagination to paint and create all the beauty here underwater. I told him, no man, God doesn't need acid. He's just that creative. His imagination is that awesome. Now listen, understand this, and I don't have too much time to really get into it. The first revelation God gives the human race is that he is our creator. And I tell you what right now, if you, the next time you're out in the park, you ask people to begin to look at the clouds and the beauty and at stars at night, and you're looking at the beauty of the ocean, and you're seeing the beauty of God's creation, we're here in Colorado and everywhere around us are these incredible mountains. Do you realize how easy it is? I love to just simply point to a mountain range and ask this guy who tells me he doesn't believe in God, where? Did this come from? Did this create itself? And you know what I've heard just time after time after time? Okay, man, I realize it. Something created the universe. See, that's revelation number one. Now think for a minute in your Bibles. What is the second great revelation God gives mankind? It's right there in the same book of the Bible. It's found in Genesis chapter 3. Have you ever, you ever asked yourself, how did this world get so messed up? Why is there so much pain? Why is there so much evil in this world? If God is such an awesome God, then why are there so many hurting people all over the world? The answer to that question is found in the second great revelation that God gives mankind. And that is this. Mankind died spiritually in the Garden of Eden. Think of what God said to Adam. The day that you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will surely die. Did God kill Adam in the sense of it was God's judgment against Adam? Or did God simply know what would happen to Adam the day he did it? And then let me ask you this. Does Adam fall over dead in the Garden of Eden? death as we know it? Or did Adam get spiritually cut off from God? This is why Jesus said you must be born again. You're born dead now. You need to be made alive by the Spirit of God. You see, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve died. They died spiritually. Can you think of the three deaths that we find in the Bible? There's physical death, there's spiritual death. There's also eternal death. And you know what Jesus came to do? Literally reverse it all. You don't have to be dead spiritually, cut off from God. And you certainly don't have to die eternally to be eternally cut off from God. It was Adam that brought the death. It was Adam that brought the sin. Yeah, I know you would say, well, it was Satan that caused it. No, Satan did what he did, and Adam did what he did. Adam chose to rebel. And you know what really happened in the Garden of Eden? Adam went from dependent on God 
listening to God and walking with God every day to now separated from God, independent of God. It's amazing. Adam's first self-conscious thoughts are, it is your fault, God, you gave the woman to me. Can you imagine that? He throws Eve under the bus literally this fast after he falls. We call it the fall of man. It's really the death of man, the spiritual death of man. Satan had lied to Adam and Eve. Satan questioned what God said. Remember this in Genesis chapter 3? Did God really say? Do you know how Satan works? He wants you to question what God has said. And then Satan directly contradicts and denies what God has said in his word. Now why do I say this to you? I run into literally hundreds and hundreds of people here in North America and around the world as we're out doing evangelism that have no understanding of why this world is in the shape it's in. And you know what the real answer is? We have walked away from God. We have chosen to go our own way. It's like Isaiah said, like sheep, we have all gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. Can I say to you today, God sent his son to reverse everything that happened in the Garden of Eden. But we can't discount it because now man is spiritually dead. God creates this incredible creation, and yet man chooses to alienate himself from God by committing sin. And you know what? Is it any different today in the people that you minister to? Do you realize why there's so much depression, so much discouragement, so many unfulfilled lives? Because they've chosen to go their own way, and they've walked away from the living God. Well, I want you to know the third great revelation is also found in Genesis chapter 3. Could you imagine that? Three of the greatest revelations God gives the entire human race we find in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The first one is that God is our creator. The second one is that man died in the Garden of Eden. Spiritually, we are cut off from the living God. You ever wonder why there are so many religions in the world? Because man knows God is out there, and yet they just don't know him. They're cut off. They're dead spiritually. Jesus Christ came to reverse all that, and here's the third great revelation. It's the first prophecy in the Bible, Genesis 3.15. Listen to these words. The seed of the woman is going to come and crush the serpent's head. Could you imagine that? Someone born of a woman is going to come and absolutely reverse everything that has happened to mankind in the Garden of Eden. I wonder who that would be. In the book of Leviticus, the Bible tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let me tell you real quick the difference between Christianity and Islam. It's the way you deal with sin. In Islam, you keep a bunch of rules and regulations and you do your best. In Christianity, you realize that without a Savior, you cannot be saved. No amount of good works, no amount of human effort, no amount of keeping of rules and laws is ever going to make you right with God. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. See, listen to this third great revelation. It's found in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. See, what I want you to get today is the gospel message. God is our creator. We died in the Garden of Eden, and God sent his Son to pay a price that none of us could ever pay. Think of all the promises that we find in the Bible. And I have so many of these that are written here in your outline in pages 21 or 22 and 23. Let me just read a few of these. Again, Romans 5, 8. When we were without strength, 
In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely will a righteous man die, or for a righteous man will one dare to die. And yet, perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, for us. He died for us. Think of that for a minute. When we were dead in our sin and in our rebellion and our selfishness, Christ came to take upon himself our sin and our failure. God so loves the human race that he got off the throne. There's a great illustration from the life of Billy Graham, of all people. One time he got caught speeding through West Texas. And when he was standing before the justice of the peace, the justice of the peace said, Billy Graham, are you guilty of speeding in our town or whatever it is? And Billy said, yes, sir, I am. I'm guilty of speeding. And the judge says, I can't change the law for you, Billy Graham. And he smacks his hammer down on his table and he says, you're guilty. And listen to this. The judge stands up, takes his robe off, goes over to the bailiff, and he pays Billy Graham's fine. The judge was a partner. But listen, he can't change the law. What can the judge do? He can get off of his, of, of his, you know, his, his judgment seat, and he can go down and pay the fine. You know what Jesus Christ did? He left heaven, and he came down here on this earth, and he put on one of these so he could pay our fine. He who knew no sin was made to become sin or made to be sin that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Think of this for a minute. Why did Jesus come? He paid the price for the sin of the world. Remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus walking up to him? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came to take away our sin. This is the message that the world needs to hear. If you'll preach creation and you'll preach the fall, then when you preach Jesus, they'll understand and it'll make sense to them. I've been with many Christians that have gone out on the streets, and the first thing that they want to say to somebody is, listen, God loves you, and God has a wonderful plan for your life. And it sounds great, and it's all true. It's just meaningless to a lost person who doesn't believe in God, and doesn't believe in creation, and doesn't believe in the fall, and doesn't believe in Jesus. You know what I have to do? Locate everybody that I am ministering to and tailor make the gospel to where it's going to have meaning and power in their life. And that's why I say there's four great revelations that are head and shoulders above all other revelations in the Bible. Without creation, there's nothing. And without the fall of man, nothing here in this world makes any sense. And without our need for a Savior, no one will ever get born again. It's very simple. Once someone believes in creation, lead them into understanding what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. And, and don't just hang it all on Adam and Eve. Ask them how they're doing in their own lives. It's not Adam and Eve's sin that we need to be concerned about so much as our sin before a living, holy, awesome God. But God so loves us that he's willing to put all that away if we'll simply repent of our sins and put our faith in Jesus. Conversion is twofold. It's me turning from what's destroying me so I can turn to Jesus and make him the Lord of my life. Without repentance, there's no real faith. And without faith, there's no real repentance. 
the two go hand in hand. And this is what conversion is, real conversion. Again, there, there are so many incredible passages of Scripture I could share with you, but I'd like to get to that fourth revelation. But i got to give you Mark 10, 45. Listen to this. The Son of Man didn't come to serve, or to be served, excuse me, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Could you imagine that? Why did Jesus come? To give his life a ransom for many. To actually go to that cross and pay a price that none of us could ever pay. Could you imagine that this is the fundamental difference between Christianity and every religion on earth? Let me just say this real quick. Religions can make someone feel better about themselves, but they can't save your soul. Religions can give you a code to live by. They can give you a sense of identity and a sense of community. They can give you a, 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 a more moral code to live your life by, but that doesn't make you right with the living God. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You know what Christianity is all about? Restoring us to the Father. Now listen, the fourth great revelation. Take a second and try to figure it out. What would the fourth great revelation be? Here it is. And no, no, no faith on earth teaches anything like it. God doesn't decide your eternal destiny. You do. I tell this to people all the time when I've taken them through creation and the fall and what Christ did. And then I say to them, listen, brother, it's not God who's going to decide your destiny. It is you that's going to decide your destiny. And you realize that's exactly what the Bible teaches. When Moses gave the first altar call in all of human history, in Exodus chapter 32, do you remember what he said? Whoever is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. You know, there's not one mention of the Levitical priesthood before that day. Who are the ones that chose to come to Moses? The Levites. Let me ask you a question. Was it God that chose the Levites, or was it the Levites that chose God? Do you know it's been that way ever since? Sometimes we talk about the sovereignty of God, like God chooses who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, and like God chooses who's going to be saved and who's going to be damned. Let me tell you something. God has given each of us. Think of John 3.16 a minute and listen to this. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Who are the whosoevers? They're the ones that choose God. Get this, guys. Four revelations, head and shoulders above the rest of them in the Bible, and they form a foundation for how to bring people to Christ. Number one, God created us. Number two, we died in the Garden of Eden. Number three, Jesus Christ loves you so much. He came and he paid your price. And now the last one, you need to make a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. <clears throat> there is salvation in no other name. If you go out and you preach the gospel, people will get saved. I love what Paul said there in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Again, very briefly, I've gone through these outlines. You have so much more in-depth in your studies. Let me encourage you to take some time and go through these verses. Go through and actually see what the Bible teaches on these subjects. If you want to learn how to win people to Jesus, then it's a simple matter of understanding God's message to the world and then learning how to make that message come alive. We're going to discuss that this next session that we have. But today, let me just say, 
You decide your eternal destiny. That's the fourth and great revelation that God gives mankind. God isn't sitting up there in heaven, unaffected by what goes on here on earth. God loves. God has compassion. God is merciful. God has provided for perfect salvation for every man, woman, boy, and girl on this planet. Now it's up to us to simply open our hearts. You see, that's how you, that's how you close the deal, if you will. Let them understand their responsibility to make Jesus the Lord of their life because they cannot save themselves. This is the difference, again, between Christianity and these world religions. World religions will tell you that you can save yourself. Well, I'm telling you, you can't. You need a Savior. His name is Jesus. Get out there and preach it, and they're going to get born again.